not going to necessarily read to you, but basically uh, you got this rack and pinion steering system. You got a pinion gear. That's a sort of a graphic drawing of the rack and pinion. The rack is basically the long uh, rack. And I actually, I've got some really good um, video that they use in your, uh, I mean, with, with this CDX thing that I like to show you on this rack and pinion steering. Because there's some elements to that that you wouldn't expect, basically. Hello, uniform person. So, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Are you pretty, are you pretty uniform? You saw my shirts and all that, right? Yeah. Did you run the extra pair of pants today? I did. Oh, very nice. All right. I'll put that on the desk in here. All right. The components of the manual rack and pinion steering system got a pinion gear, steel bar with teeth cutting to one side, what the rack is. That's how you would, uh, you see anything on your, look, in your, look at your questions now. Uh, the gears are enclosed in a housing made of aluminum or steel and aluminum. And the pinion gear is attached to the steering wheel through the steering shaft. So you got the steering shaft coming from your steering wheel, and it usually goes through a, like a wiggle joint because of angles not perfect, and that's okay. And it's going to go down there, and you're actually going your pinion. When you turn that pinion gear, it's going to move that rack. On the ends of that rack, you got some tie rods. You got me? You got you got inner and outer tie rods. Uh, the inner tie rod end is the one that's got the threads on it. Uh, it's actually threads onto the end of the rack. And it also has got a little ball joint in there that can wear out. And so one of the things I want to encourage you guys to do when you're checking, when you're getting ready to do a wheel alignment, one of the first things you're supposed to do after you check the air pressure is get that thing up in the air and let's see if there's any slack in any of the steering parts or if you see anything bent or wore out or whatever. And one of the ways we do that is we're going to grab the wheels and we're going to pull this way on the wheels and we're going to pull this way on the wheels. And we're going to see, we're going to pull vertically and side, and we're going to see if there's something sloppy there. You'll feel it if there is. If there's something sloppy, you either have your buddy pull on the wheels or you pull on the wheels and have him look, and you're going to see what's wore out. And then you'll know what needs to be replaced. You got me? All right. Now, the rack is a round steel bar with teeth machined into one side, and outlined are metal bushings at each end of the gear housing support the rack. Uh, and when you've got a power steering rack, like a hydraulic power steering rack, uh, you know you got these accordion boots on each end of your rack and pinion thing, you know? You know, these accordion boots on the very end. If you see oil in there and that rack is leaking, there's not supposed to be any oil in those accordion boots. If oil is in those accordion boots, the seals in the rack are compromised. So just remember that. You know, the, the accordion boots are only there to keep moisture and dirt out. And, uh, you know, they actually a lot of times they have a tube going from one side to the other to transfer air back and forth whenever one of them squishes and the other one stretches and all that. All right. <coughs> Now then, an adjustable spring-loaded support bearing is used at the gear end of the rack, and that maintains the proper mesh between the rack and pinion gears. You need them to stay meshed. If your rack and pinion gears came out of mesh, what would happen? You would suddenly not be able to steer the car, and you would sort of you would go off toward you know wherever. Wherever it's pointing. Have you ever lost uh, your lost steering, you know, for any reason at all? You know, one of the things that happens sometimes, it's real easy to happen in a shop and in here if we're not real careful. You know the, those plastic splash shields that you take out <coughs> under the, uh, behind the tire? People leave those off. And what happens when you leave the splash shield off is they go through a puddle, <coughs> water splashes up there, it wets their pulleys, and the belt on the crankshaft pulley starts spin, start slipping, and then you've lost your power steering and your alternator light comes on. And losing your power steering can ruin your whole day if it happens at the wrong time. So all we got to make sure you put them things on there. <coughs> okay, you guys are uh, finding some answers on that page, aren't you? All right. All right. The rack, the pinion gear can be a helical or a straight cut gear. Helical meaning a spiral, you know, have you ever seen them spiral cut, like in a transmission, uh, spiral cut gears? Uh, straight cut gear is actually like a spur gear, like reverse in a transmission. You'll get to see those. Uh, if the gear is an integral part of the pinion shaft, and support for the pinion can be supplied with nylon bushings, upper and lower thrust bearings, or upper and lower bearings. You know, there's all kinds of ways they can be designed. See this right here? There's your better picture, right there. Now, this part out here on the end that you see right there, that right there is tie rod end. <coughs> Got me? And this right here's your steering shaft going in. You got this accordion boot out there. You're going to see this under the car. You see a little ball <coughs> joint right there? A little ball joint on that inner <coughs> rack where it goes onto the end of that rack is actually, it tends to uh, wear. 
and you're going to find a lot of those that you had to change out. Now I'll tell you what happened one day. We had this Taurus, and whenever that happens, you got to take that boot loose, <coughs> that boot in there between the, the from the inner tie rod to this steering rack housing, and you're going to screw this off of there. It actually is screwed onto the to the end of that rack. You can see it down there. That's where it screws on. One of your worksheets that I give you is telling you to take a, a steering gear, and I've got one in here you can use for that, and take that boot back and screw that thing off and screw it back on. Now, we had a Taurus one time. We had to replace those on. And that son of a gun, we actually, I've, I've got a wrench that you might have seen in my big wrench door. This is, I bent it into a 90 so I could reach up in there and slide it on that because it was the right size and turn and screw that uh, inner tie right off of that Taurus. That thing would not move. It absolutely would not move. And we actually had a big pry bar on it and all that kind of stuff trying to screw that thing off. And I knew we were doing it the right way. It ain't a left-hand thread there. But I said, well, maybe uh, if we heat it up a little bit. Well, apparently they had put some super strong Loctite on that thing because after I heated it up just a little bit. You don't want to heat it too much or you'll mess up the seals in the rack. You got me? You'll mess up the seals in the rack. So we heated it just enough to make that nut good and warm. And after we did that, you could screw it off of there with your hand. <laughs> so just if you run into a situation where you're trying to screw that inner tie rod in off the end of that rack, you know you might want to apply just a little bit of heat to it and see if it'll you know, loosen up. Now, like I say, if you just keep heating and heating and heating and heating, the heat's going to travel into that rack, go down into there, and you're going to wind up with a leaking rack and pinion. Now we've got a steering rack that we're going to have to put on one of these college trucks that's coming over here because the steering rack's leaking, and uh, we replaced the steering rack not long ago. We won, or he built one from the parts house. Now the one we put on it's leaking. The college truck from the other campus. Yeah. Did something with Tim's truck, didn't we? The uh, Dakota. We didn't put a rack on it, I don't think. I think we put the uh, tie rod in. Yeah, we did put tie rod in on that truck. Okay. Yeah, typically you got a rack and a power system there. Uh, the steering gear, the power cylinder, control valve, all made in one unit. Uh, do you know how they use a, how the electric power steering works on some of these cars? Uh, the GM cars, like your Cobalt, I mean, as a matter of fact, I think Daniel Kelly's Cobalt set up like this, and we ought to look under there. There is a great big electric, well, if you look under the hood on those, you ought to see a plain old rack and pinion without any hydraulic hoses or anything hooked to it. It, is like, it looks like manual rack and pinion. But inside the car, at the base of the steering, well, <coughs> the base of the steering column, there is a great big motor that almost looks like a wiper motor. <laughs> And it's got an electronic module on there, and when you turn the wheel, it knows you turn the wheel, and, it, and that electric motor helps you turn the wheels. But the power steering, and it's pretty much maintenance free most of the time, they don't get any trouble. All right, so that, uh, and one, there was this uh, Chevy Equinox out there that had electric power steering on it. And she was having a belt squealing issue. And a lot of times, if somebody didn't push the power steering pulley on there far enough, how many of you have done that worksheet where you press the power steering pulley off and on with that tool? Have you done that? Yeah, there's actually one. If you don't put it on there as far as it's supposed to go, the belt will squeal, it'll eat the belt up, and you'll, you know, bind up in a mess. So I said, well, I looked in the Chevy uh, TSBs and, you know, Identifix and all, and it says, make sure that power steering pulley is where it's supposed to be. And when I got looking for the power steering pulley, and I realized after about two minutes that this thing had electric power steering on it, and whatever problem she had, it was unrelated to the power steering pump pulley because she had no power steering as far as hydraulic. She had electric power steering. So I, had, I thought I'd have some fun with the students. I said, we're in steering and suspension. You guys come out here and check the power steering fluid on this thing for me. They looked on that thing for 20 minutes before I finally told them it, it had electric power steering. There was no hydraulic, you know, on it. Okay. Now then. Okay. Inner tie rod assemblies attached to the rack. We talked about that. Bellows type boots cover the tie rods. Assemblies and seal out dirt and moisture. Inner bulkhead and rack seals retain the fluid within the housing. That's inside uh, on the rack in there, you're going to have seals in it. Uh, and then a manual system, the rack's teeth match with the pinion teeth, same deal. And then you got, in a power system, the pinion shaft and control valve work in the same way as rotary valve assembly and integral recirculating ball. Now, we didn't talk about recirculating ball power steering, but I used to have a great big old steering gear out here, and I still got one, and I would have everybody take it apart and put it back together. The recirculating ball system, like you find on old, your old Ford truck's got one. Mm -hmm. Recirculating ball type steering gear. And you can take it apart and put it back together and with all them balls and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the thing about it is nobody rebuilds those. You know, whenever you're going to get one, you typically get it from the uh, parts store. 
But it's a good thing to know how to take it apart and put it back together just in case you have to. The problem with that is it's really hard to get it to adjust right, if you understand what I'm saying, to where it works right. Because the power steering part of it is real particular. Okay, so you got steel lines routing fluid to and from the rack pressure chambers. See that? See the points for the pressure chambers? If you put pressure on one side of that rack, it's got a little piston in there, it drives it one way. You put pressure on the other side, it drives the other way. Nothing to it. All right, your balancing tube, it goes, see the little balancing tube right there? It goes from one side to the other. Uh, that balancing tube actually carries air from one to the other. All right, since it's the speed of the vehicle, if you've got speed sensitive steering, uh, have you ever driven a car down the highway like these older cars and when you was going down the road it felt like the steering was too squirrely? You know what I mean? Like if it's, if it's too easy to steer going down the road it feels like it's just kind of it's too easy to steer. And so you have these road cars they have the steering that's a little stiffer when you're in the parking lot but it drives better on the road. So they want the best of both worlds. A lot of these vehicles now have got a variable assist power steering. They might call it VAPS or something like that. They, or you think, huh? Uh, I was going to ask you, so uh, balancing tube, it just balances the air? Yeah, it moves the air back and forth from one bellows to the other. When you squeeze one bellows, the air's got to go somewhere. And so, I will tell you this though, some of them have just got a very small little vent in that tube so the air can come and go without having to have a balancing tube. But the people that are conscientious about not letting dirt get sucked in there, they'll put it so that they've got a tube going in from one to the And you'll see this, it's just a plain old tube that sticks in that one bellows and sticks in the other and when the air squeezes out of this one it goes into the other when it squeezes out of that one it goes this goes back and forth that's a balancing tube all right can you see right here what you got uh rack and pinion power steering senses vehicle speed and the steering load does your adequate road feel at the steering wheel you know you want to feel like you're actually turning some wheels when you're going down the road and that's you know you're basically there's a bunch of different ways of doing that all right yeah, and that's pretty much right there. Okay. Now, how many questions have you not yet answered? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Four, five, six. All right. All right, I'm going to see if I can speed this up a little bit, because y'all have seen about all the pictures you need to see. Let's see if I can power that off. All right. Yeah. we got to make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music here. All right, five components of the power rack and pinion shaft and control assembly are what? Oil seals, high frame bearings, tie rods, gear plugs, rack and pinion. Wow, you got some stuff there. Uh, something else I was looking for was stub shaft, torsion bar, valve body, pinion shaft, and valve spool. Okay. Bracket and shaft. Yep. Mounting bracket shaft, pinion, lap ring bearing, oil seal. Yeah, you're, you're good. You guys are all getting legitimate components, and I'm not going to mark you for that. Um, Bellows boots seal what well, they do. They seal the inner tie rod ends. You're supposed to keep dust and dirt out, right? Okay. The purpose of the balancing tube between the two boots is to let air go back and forth. That's not hard. Okay, here's the thing. Let's talk about this. What's the difference between pull and wander? <coughs> if it's wandering, it's just kind of going all over the road. <laughs> if it's pulling, it's always trying to drift in the same direction. You got me? So wander is like it's over here, it's over there, and you're, you know, seems like, and you'll have that if you've got uh, slack in your steering or something like that, you're going to have it wandering around all over the road. Um, and uh, lubricant in a manual rack and pinion gears needs to be changed every 60,000 miles. <laughs> That's false. <laughs> We're not going to change that. I will tell you this, though. General Motors has got a procedure for, for flushing the power steering system, but they really don't have a service inter interval for that that I've ever seen. Uh, and if you go to a lot of these oil change places, one of the things they try to sell you is a power steering system flush, right? Uh, list four possible power steering pump leak points. What about the shaft and the seal, the pump, the pump shaft, uh, or hoses? Leak at the outlet hose fitting, leak at the return hose fitting, leak through the pump housing. The pump housing can leak if it's uh, porous casting, which means it's got a little pinhole in it. You'll see that. Shaft and seal, you know, pump and shaft. Outlet hose fitting, you know. Okay, technician A says the power steering return line will leak primarily when the steering wheel is turned. That's not right. The power steering return line is the one that doesn't have any pressure in it. It's just got fluid flowing back in there. Uh, technician B says the return line is usually a metal line with crimp fittings at both ends. That's wrong, too. 
The one with the crimped fittings at both ends is a pressure line. It'll have like 12, 1500 pounds of pressure on it whenever you're really steering hard. And whenever you're, let me tell you a brief little story here about a Lexus that we had in here. How many of you guys like a Lexus? A Lexus is cool, right? A Lexus is a cool car. You know? yeah. We had a Lexus SC300 in here that belonged to a guy, and it had a power steering leak. Okay, so I say, all right, let's we just replace that power steering pressure line because it was, you know, leaking where it was put together there. You know, the rubber part of it had been compromised. And so I start checking into that. And I say, we've got a power steering line that we need for this power, I mean, power steering pressure line for this Lexus. They said, well, we can't uh, get that from the aftermarket supplier. And I said, so I get a hold of Lexus. They're wanting $450 for a power steering pressure line. $450. Okay, so I said, well, I'm going to do something different. Let it ring. I'll answer it in a minute. Uh, power steering pressure line, what we've got here is, I said, let's take, and sometimes the parts house guy, he can actually take the existing line, and he's got some special, you know, ferrule fittings and all that he can replace the rubber parts of it with. So he cuts off the metal tube, <coughs> and, which is bent a particular way, and then he replaces the rubber part of the line. Okay, mm -hmm. so I said, well, let's pull this power steering line off, and we send it over there. Well, when we send it over there, the fittings that he had were 10 millimeter fittings, and Lexus, bless their sweethearts, used an 11 millimeter tube. But he had already cut the power steering line before he found out about this. <laughs> now this power steering, this metal part of this line is real thick. It's not like a real thin wall piece of tube. It's just thick and it's strong and all that. So basically what we got going on there is I says, well, um, Sam, I said, send me that stuff back over here and send me the rubber part of the line that you were going to fix it with. So Sam sends it over there and then he takes the... Uh, I took, well, actually, Sam had actually tried to put it on the grinder, grind it down so that he could use his ferrule. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Are you going to be able to grind that line perfectly round? No. Hold it. Heck no. So, anyway, he brings it back over here, and I cut it off down to a place where the grinding that he did wasn't there. And, you know, he was sort of in a, between a rock and a hard place down trying to just, you know, do damage control. And so I put the thing in the vise, and I got some 100 grit. Or eighty or no hundred grit crocus, crocus cloth and sanded it down to ten millimeter, mm. which it didn't hurt at all on thing. You know it's only half a millimeter smaller on each side, and so which is what what's how much how many thousands of an inches a millimeter? Point zero zero one, right? No, forty thousand. It's forty thousand of an inches a millimeter. Got me? Remember that forty thousand of an inches a millimeter. Can you remember that? Abby, remember that forty thousand. I know how much you love math. Forty thousands of an inch is a millimeter. Tell me, a millimeter is forty thousandths of an inch. Can you remember that? Can you remember that? A millimeter is forty thousandths of an inch. This is going to stand you in good stead if you can burn that in. Okay. Burn. Yeah. All right. Forty thousandths of an inch is a millimeter. Now that's a that's real that's real real close. I mean, there's some you know infinitesimal fractions there, but forty thousand. If you as a rule of thumb, forty thousandths of an inch is a millimeter. Okay. Now then, anyway, Sam. So we sanded it off. We put it back together, and we fixed that guy's power steering on that Lexus for like. Ten bucks. Sam felt so bad about it, he didn't even charge us for the rubber part <laughs> of that line, and we got that thing going. Well, even a used one from a Lexus Boneyard between here and Montgomery up there was like uh, $150 for a used power steering line for an SC300. I mean, that was just downright crazy to, to have to have that much spend that much money on a stupid power steering line. You can get a power steering line for just about any American car for $22 from the parts the store. The yeah, they don't hardly cost nothing. Yeah, that's basically what it is. If it says Toyota on it, you're going to pay through the nose. Alan Cobb's car had a uh, a little vapor pressure sensor. That sensor was so small that I could put it in my mouth and close my mouth, and you would not know what was in there. That's how little that sensor was. It was $200. And for another thing, catastrophic thing happened on this uh, lady's car out here, a Ford 500, and we got an accelerator pedal and an electronic throttle body for her car, both of those items, and it costs less than that vapor pressure sensor that would cost for that Toyota. And this is two great big pieces of high-tech hardware. As, you know, what's, what's, the, you know, what's the benefit? Okay. Now, let's see. Um, use your own common sense. What's most, one of the most important steps in finding a source of any oil leak? Look at the Did you aware? <laughs> huh? I'm going to get some brake parts cleaner or something. 
or steam cleaner and dry that sucker off. I'm going to get all that oil gone. I'm going to get all the filth gone and everything. Now, another thing you can do if you're looking for an oil leak is you can spray that thing down with Dr. Scholl's foot powder. You ever use any foot powder? You know the white powder you spray? If you spray that thing down with Dr. Scholl's foot powder, it's going to show up black where that leak is real fast. Mm. See, that oil is going to become pushing out through that foot powder. And that foot powder will coat everything, you see. So you can find it real fast like that. We can also put some dye in there. And we got a black light, and that dye is going to light up like a Christmas tree. That's a good way to do it, too. We can find all kinds of fluid leaks with dye. And yeah, that's really neat. Okay, but you're going to clean the, the uh, suspected area first. Finally, number 10, leakage through the gear housing indicates what? Basically, you're going to have a porous casting or a hole in the housing. And I've seen that. One time I was replacing that thing. I went to Lowe's and I bought this, uh, you know, this piece, piece under your sink that comes right off the sink and then goes down to your trap. Because, yeah. you know, the one that was on my wife's sink in her bathroom was rotted out. And I put that thing under there. And you know how aggravating it is sometimes when you're doing plumbing work, you work and work and you put tape and you do all this stuff and it still leaks. You know, <laughs> and you fight with it and you fight with it and it still leaks. Well, I worked on that thing until 10 o'clock at night and what I found was that brass, that cast uh, brass thing had a little porous casting in the side of it. I mean, it was a little pinhole in the side of that doggone thing. I kept thinking it was something I was doing wrong. So, I, you know what I did? I got some Lexal and put on that thing and it's still there <laughs> as far as I know. It's good stuff. Anyway, that's a, that, that winds up that test right there.